Parks is here from the Maryland Department um, of Agriculture, and he's going to give us an update on pesticide regulations and what he's been doing. Thank you, Jenny. Can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to talk like this all the time. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is David Parks. I'm with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. I want to thank everybody for being here today. Thanks, Jenny, as well, for all her hard work. Uh, dealing with all the sponsors and presenters, all the phone calls she must uh, take and make is uh, probably pretty astounding. But, yeah, thanks, Jenny. And, um, you know, she didn't give you guys a break. She let the sponsors come in right before me. I know a lot of you, your brain will absorb only what your bladder will hold, you know, so <laughs> you can feel free to go to the restroom. No, we're going to take a break after this. Okay, there you go. Jenny said we're going to take a break after this, okay? So just squeeze real tight, <laughs> okay? Don't go out and use the trees. I know you guys are farm guys. Again, this is the update for this year for the pesticide regulations of year 2022. A few changes, but um, a lot of things going on, as you know, and uh, I don't want to try to be a whole mess of doom and gloom. I'm going to try to keep it pretty bright because we've had a, a pretty uh, challenging few last couple weeks anyway, so try to keep it bright and easy. Um, our program manager now is Rob Hofstetter. Rob took the place of Mr. Dennis Howard, who left us a few years ago. Um, the enforcement special, the enforcement coordinator and special programs coordinator is actually Kelly Love. Um, she just got that position about a week ago. So um, she is now in that position. She's also a managing um, supervisor and inspector as well. Okay, so um, that we did make that change. Um, and I'll, I'll go through a couple of changes as well that are coming up on the map so you can see it a little bit better. Certification training, um, she had a challenging year come in, as we all have in the department, um, Shweta Sharma. Um, she's new, she's very smart, very nice lady, um, very easy to deal with and easy to talk to. Um, Shweta um, brings a lot to the table and hopefully by next year she'll be up to full speed and be able to help those um, with those questions that you have regarding your licenses, certification, things of that nature. And we're always out here. Um, to answer those questions as well, us inspectors, you know, I know I've talked to a few of you over the last few months, and, and look, you know, if uh, it's been a challenging year, as I said, for everybody, including us, and one of the big challenges was when we certified or approved a lot of these courses, it was all going to be in person because COVID was on a, a flat line, but then right after that, it spiked, so a lot of them switched over to went back to virtual, there were a lot of questions. I was fielding 10 or 15 phone calls a day. Are we gonna have, you know, in person, is it gonna be virtual what the situation was? I myself am glad to be able to sit here today and see all your frowning faces looking at me up here, like, you know, so, um, but yeah. So it was a challenging year to say the least. And, um, you know, we're getting on the downhill side of it and hopefully everybody's gotten their certifications straight. You're here today um, and I'll go into renewals in a few minutes as well but we'll go through it um, as I go through the slides. Office administration is Jess. Um, unfortunately, second lady, Ms. Carolyn Shepke, um, she made a great dramatic um, improvement in her life and moved to the Eastern Shore, and uh, now, unfortunately, she's leaving us. So Carolyn was really good, um, really informative and very knowledgeable in our department. So we'll be, we'll be losing her here in the next couple of weeks, unfortunately. So again, even more shorthanded than before. Hannah is in the office and also Gina are both in the office. Special Supervisor again is Kelly Love along with, him, like I said, the Enforcement and Special Programs Coordinator. And then we have Bray that's on the Western Shores and Inspecting Supervisor. Inspectors themselves, going to the map versus looking at it in a little, little writing. I know you guys see pictures better, just like me. In Western Maryland, you got Braden Hardpool. Um, in Montgomery and Howard County, you have Yapa. And uh, down in Southern Maryland on the Western Shore, you have Bray. Um, up in Baltimore, Harford, Cecil, and Baltimore City, we did hire a lady this past year. And um, a few of you may have met her in the inspections. Unfortunately, um, her name was Tori. Her husband got a job offer in Michigan. So she was with us about six months and then went to Michigan, unfortunately. Really nice gal, but um, so that position is vacant on the Northern side. Now we're getting ready to advertise a position for the Eastern Shore, over near Baltimore as well, and the upper, we're gonna split the shore basically is what we're gonna do. It's always supposed to have two inspectors, so it'll, it'll split up the, um, the territory as far as what I have to cover at the current time. COVID-19, I've hit on that a little bit. 
Um, we were working throughout the whole thing. We actually shut down for just a couple weeks, and um, we had actually a couple of some phone calls coming in regarding applications, things of that nature. Um, so we opened back up right in the height of COVID and kept working through that. Um, and then we started slowly in inspections, albeit from far away and then closer and then in person. And now we're back to full swing and uh, doing inspections all the time in person. COVID-19 with the lack of, um, as far as the, um, on the office side, we had a lot of challenges because they were shutting down the office in Annapolis, making so people couldn't come in, had to have limit staff, get checked in when you did come in. Um, so, you know, that was a challenge for all of us. Um, they are back to full staff now, and um, we are working still mainly on through email and online, but you should be able to get through if you do have a phone call a lot better than what you could do before. It was a situation where they were forwarding the phone calls from the office to um, the individual cell phones, and now there's someone there to answer at the office. We're back to testing in person, which is really nice. Um, we've got a test coming up April 14th, I believe, um, in Denton. Um, they are in person again, and then in Annapolis as well, and then out in Western Maryland. But it's good to be testing back in person. Um, there for a while, we were doing the, in, the exams outside in Annapolis, um, and we were out exposed to the weather during those few months there, and a uh, six month period or so where we were out, whether it was snowing or 100 degrees at one time and snow at one day, so a lot of variance there. But it's nice to have them both, again, the exam on here on the shore used to be down in Cambridge, now it's in Denton, it's more midway, so that's nice to have it, you know, more in, more in the middle of the, of the region versus all the way down in Cambridge. We do the uh, private exams as well. Um, you can take a private exam at the commercial exams at, in Denton or Annapolis or Boonesboro. Um, or a lot of times Jenny has one coming up. What's the date, Jenny? March 18th. March 18th, sorry. Um, March 18th, Jenny has one coming up as well. I had a couple people call me yesterday on that one. I've heard about enough of COVID. Everybody want, anybody want to raise their hands on that one? <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, we did, we do do regional training every year and um, with the EPA and we were to host state this year, which was a lot of work. It was very interesting. Um, we had a tour of Astigue Island um, to look at their integrated pest management program as far as the, the noxious weeds and, and, uh, and uh, invasive species of weeds and things. But that was really informative, informative. And then we also had Dr. Jesse Ketterman from the University of Maryland Extension Educator. Um, she put a presentation on in regards to um, the tough times and things that are going on. Again, you know, like I was sitting here, it's like doom and gloom, man. You know, let's brighten up the spirit a little bit, you know. But, um, you know, unfortunately, people do go through tough times, you know. And you all know one another better than anybody. If you're talking to one another, if you're not seeing somebody at the coffee shop or the restaurant or Dunkin' Donuts or wherever it is you might go, you know, maybe give them a call. We all have these phones on our sides and we're all on them all the time. But to pick up and call a friend, sometimes you might think they weigh 10,000 pounds, you know. So just lean, just reach out to that person that you haven't seen in a while. Maybe say hi and uh, see how they're doing. Um, there's a, some hotlines on their websites. I can provide these for you if you need them. And also hotlines as far as number 211 is an informative um, resource to um, call. And it'll get you through many of the crisis hotlines that you can get involved with or you can get them involved. <clears throat> so just let's start the conversation and look out for your family and friends, okay? Back to basics. <laughs> this is basically our regulations. This is our book. I have a few in a van if you all need any. Um, Comar 150501, regulations pertaining to pesticide applicators law. This is our regulations in the state of Maryland that we have to adhere to. And in the state, pesticide applicator numbers, um, we have 1,371 licensed pest control businesses, 251 licensed public agencies, 2,033 certified private applicators, 6,998 registered technicians. <coughs> ah, it is a pointer, I wasn't sure, it works. Nobody's used it. <laughs> um, I want you to pay a little bit of attention to that number right there here in a couple minutes as far as on the commercial side. Certified applicators, 6,183 applicators in the state, 178 restricted use pesticide dealers, okay? 
Those are the dealers that require license in order to sell restricted use pesticides. Numbers are down from the previous years, a lot to do with many different situations, but a lot of it is just people haven't renewed. So we're still dealing with that on a daily basis and trying to get everybody, you know, we still have people that didn't renew from last year are still calling in, so. Um, what kind of applicator are you? And pretty much know your need, you guys know either a private, a public agency, or you're a commercial applicator in this room, or a registered technician. I don't know if anybody's registered in, a registered technician in here or not, but it's gonna come into play more and more all the time. I'll go into that into a few minutes. ZUs you need every year as far as for what you need if you're commercial. In those categories, you need eight credits. Six if you're in these three categories, or four if you're in these, or private applicators. Um, the categories, as um, far as private applicators, your license renews or expires at the end of, it, of the year that your, your license expires, December 31st. So guys, I'll go into that in a minute as well. Um, you know, consultants do as well, commercial applicators, at end, your license expires at the end of June. Reciprocity, um, one-time process for a non-resident, and um, you cannot be a resident of Maryland and have your Delaware's applicator's license and then try to use re reciprocity and uh, recipro oh, I struggle with that word. Reciprocity in the state of Maryland. Um, if you live in Maryland, you must get your applicator's license and uh, take the exam and get your test or get your license. Um, a lot, it may apply to some guys on the shore if you have, or on the Delaware line. If you have any questions, you can see me after the meeting as well. Renewals, here we go. So this is the big thing that's been the hot topic of the last year, renewals. Um, first things first, what you're going to do is you're going to get that lovely little postcard in the mail. It's a teeny tiny postcard about this big. Um, I've had two people this year said they found it in their Acme flyer. You know, so yeah, it can slide in there. Um, I make it a habit of shaking them things before I toss them in the trash so um, or use them for starting a fire. <laughs> but you can look for those, pest, those postcards. Um, if you're a private applicator, they're going to come probably around the 1st of November. Um, if you haven't seen them by the middle of November, I would be calling someone, albeit me or the section, the department. Give them a call. Say, I haven't seen my card. Um, once you get that card, which I'll go through in a minute, um, and you also get an email as well. And that email probably, a lot of people, they give us their email that um, coincides with their license as an email that they don't use very often. And a lot of times, unfortunately, even if you do, that email will go to a spam. Um, for some reason, that e.gov um, website or email address, it, it spams it. So, you know, around the first, year, first of November, keep in mind to either look for that postcard or keep an eye on your spam um, folder in your email. The one good thing about that, once you do have that postcard right there, um, that number never changes. So that's your number. So once you get one, you can keep it, put it in your phone, in your notes, whatever you want to, just make sure you hold on to that renewal code because that allows you to get into the website, which is where your renewal is. I know a lot of you struggle with the internet um, and, this, and some of these websites, and, and this isn't the easiest website to maneuver, I'll be the first to admit. Um, but you kind of got to struggle through it and, and, and get in there and, and do it. If you don't, um, you know, give us a call. There's also tutorial videos on our website that you can watch. Stop that video on one screen and then do that process on the other screen while you're renewing your license. Um, it works very well, they're very informative, so uh, you know, utilize those, those um, videos to help you go through the renewal. I had a gentleman the other day, he said, I just do not have email. He said, I don't do email. Um, so if that be the case, just call us. You know, the year your license is gonna expire around November and we'll send you out a renewal registration form and just send it to you in the mail, okay? That's last case scenario. We deal with some Amish up north in Cecil County and areas like that near the Pennsylvania line, that's what we do with them, okay? And that still is under construction and it, it is very, leaves a lot to be desired. The sheets, have they signed these sheets yet, Jenny? Is this what they're signing? Okay, I wasn't sure if it was just a registration or if you passed them in. So these are the sheets that you need to sign. Make sure you sign these sheets. 
Yep. If you have not, yes, ma'am. If, they, if you have not signed those sheets, they're all the way back against the wall in the next room, okay? Sign those sheets, write down your license number, write it down. When you sign that sheet, that does not renew your license. I've had a dozen people this year from two years ago when their license expired when, at the beginning of COVID. They said, I've been to all the meetings, and they had. That was all in there, but that does not renew your license. You have to go online and renew your license yourself. Okay, so don't mistake that, signing that for being a, uh, your renewal for your license. Certification numbers. This is for a registered employee. A lot of private applicators in here today. This is what your private applicator looks like, private applicator card looks like. <clears throat> so um, a couple years ago, we started in, or they, in Maryland, the... Corpyrophus um, was started to be degraded to not basically not be able to use and as a, in the state of Maryland. And as of in December 31st of last year, all uses are prohibited in the state of Maryland. We were kind of above and beyond that in the EPA. As far as the EPA, now the EPA is kind of starting to weed Corpyrophus out as well. One change they did make was the Neonicotinoid Pollinator Protection Act. Um, was amended so the systemic neonics can only be sold to certified applicators and or farmers and must be out of the reach of general consumers a lot of the I, I found one the other day and uh, the, the entity or the establishment I was dealing with was actually a restricted use pesticide dealer but they had it on the lot on the shelf where it was at, at, uh, available to the general public so we had to kind of switch gears a little bit and put it behind the shelf. They can still sell it because they did have a restricted use pesticide dealer's license, but they cannot have it in the, where the general public can uh, get a hold of that product. Federal certification training. So this was the big thing that I hit on that 6,983 registered technicians in the state of Maryland. Well, the EPA is, um, ad adopting regulations so, as such that restricted use pesticides on a commercial side can only be applied by certified applicators, not registered technicians. Um, in the state of Maryland, we have to adhere at least to EPA standards as far as our regulations and um, the way the regulations are written. So in the next 12 to 15 months, that will be the case. Um, how long that all takes to get actually in the litigation and <laughs> regulations, you know, it's beyond me, but it is coming. So um, if you're on a commercial side and you don't have your certified applicator's license, as we know, we've seen the gly glyphosate and the lawsuits and the, you know, it's already been pulled from consumer, um, con uh, uh, consumer purchase and things of that nature. More and more, there's more and more restrictions and more and more products that will be listed, I'm sure, as restricted use. Additional dicamba and uh, 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 paracot training. Um, uh, Paul had hit on this earlier as well, um, just a little bit. But just remember, guys, the yearly online dicamba training and then the online paracot training, which is only every three years, okay? Um, I've had a lot of people ask me about that, about those this year. They, they just go online, you can just Google or whatever search engine you wanna use, Dicamba training, and it'll come up. It's a little course you take, print out your certification. When you get that printout, keep it with you in the field. If someone checks you, albeit me or someone from the EPA, you know, um, if they look at that, they need to see your license, you need to have your license and those certifications on you as well. I just keep them all with, right with my license. Um, you can also do a screenshot of them on your phone as well. Just make sure that that's available to you. On, when you're applying pesticides in the field, our regulation is written as such. You have to have the label with you. Um, a lot of guys rely on their phones for their labels. I've checked two people now, I'm sorry, that when they went to pull the label up, label up on their phone, they couldn't get service. So if you're down on a neck somewhere, just remember that. If you don't have that on your phone, just rip one of those labels off of the, off of the product that you're using. The disposal program was a new program this year that was old years ago, but now they've picked it back up with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, it's a good program. Um, it's, of course, it was stemmed a lot by the um, poisoning of the eagles um, and the EPA 
Um, we got a grant from the EPA that allowed us to do the pesticide collection, um, of course. And uh, we collected, um, right now we have 41,000 pounds of pesticide stated for disposal in 38 sites in 18 counties across the state. Um, I did, I was really surprised. I did an inventory on a couple sites and um, there were a couple that had numerous bags of furidam. I, I was very surprised how much furidam was, was still out there. Um, and, you know, there's, there's been a bill proposed to make um, furidam, carbofurin, I should say, to make carbofurin illegal to have in your possession. Right now it's rid as such, you cannot use it nor sell it. But that process is starting to take place where it's not legal to have. So um, just keep that in mind. Well, how this works is um, hopefully it'll come up again this year. We haven't got it completely approved, but it's looking pretty good. Um, and we have not, if you signed up for that last year, we have not collected the pesticides from last year yet. It should be done any time, but um, it has not taken place yet. But around the 1st of May, um, this should go back up on our, inter, uh, up on our website, hopefully. Um, there will be a sign-up sheet, an application form. You have to take kind of an inventory of what you have and uh, write it down, send it in, and then the process will start from there. Rob or Kelly will give you a call and talk to you about, you know, exactly how much you have, what containers, things of that nature, and go over that. And they may even send me out to take an inventory, as they've done in a few cases with some large stuff. Um, this does include some rinse aid as well. So if you have some rinse aid, that can take place as long as it's pesticide related and doesn't have petroleum-based products in it, okay? I went to one gentleman, I actually had to sample the drums and he said it was pesticide, but we found a lot of oil in it, okay? So keep that in mind. Field Watch is a tool that's out there for you. Um, as an applicator, you can certainly jump on there and look around and see um, you know, sensitive crops that are in your area, beehives, things of that nature. Um, we go through this pretty much every year, but it is a neat tool to see just to get an idea of what's in your, your area. With more and more people moving into the area and just through that woods or over that Leland Cypress you know, line on the other side of that, that uh, yard, they may have stuck up a couple beehives, you know, and uh, I have a friend that does beekeeping and he and I converse and I talk to him and he mentions this in some of his beekeeping meetings as well. So to try to get them guys to register those, those um, beehives. So you know where they are and you can keep them in mind when you're applying your pesticides. Complaints have went up. Um, a lot of people are working from home. Um, you know guys, just, I tell everybody, you know, I check you because it's part of it. But everybody out there this day, is, this day and age is watching and they all have phones and you know, they're all ready to take a picture of you. So, um, but ultimately, as an applicator, you're responsible for your application. Just keep that in mind. It's, it's just that simple. So keep that in mind, guys. Um, this goes both ways. Um, we've had some situations over the last, last couple of years where um, we've had applicators actually calling in and complaining about people that are complaining about them, um, which is something that we have to work through and, and uh, take in and at a case at a time. Um, We've had one lady call into the department over, call in or con contact the, the department over a thousand times over the last year. So um, she's, you know, calls if someone's in her, every time someone's in her community, things of that nature, if she sees anything, um, you know, and, uh, and now she's um, after the IPM programs in the schools. So it's from one thing right to another. So. Um, you know, a lot of people are out there watching you guys. Just be mindful of what you're doing. And, uh, you know, if you have somebody harassing you, you can certainly call us or we're aware of the situation. I mean, if you feel as though they're threatening you or something like that, of course, certainly call, call the um, law enforcement first. But, you know, if you have a situation, at least then we're aware of what the, you know, the whole picture will be versus getting one side of the story. <clears throat> Enforcement update, records, guys, this is a copy of our record form that we have. I have some in the van if you guys need any. Um, that is the, all the information that we require in our regulations for applications. Um, you guys, um, you know, need to, it's, it, the records are there for you as much as they are for any of us. 
you know, someone comes up and says, what did you apply, when? Um, be careful with some of your software and your machines. Uh, make sure it has that information if they're in, all in there. If it doesn't, it, that, you know, it's something that you need to add, albeit by hand or if you print them out or just keep them on file. Just make sure you keep that, um, keep those records and you need to keep your records for two years. Notification as far as um, immediately notified the department by telephone of any pesticide accident, incident, fire, flood, or spill, and report the full details of the event, including any remediation. Make sure you're safe. That's the main thing. Um, you know, don't endanger yourself to make a phone call, that's for certain. It also requires notification of any event that is a broad statement. An event could be several things, including application to the wrong property, failing to notify the PSI, a PSI, a crazy person chasing you around and jumping on your equipment. You know, again, it goes both ways, so that's what we're trying to get across to here. <laughs> communication, communication, communication prevents confrontation. That's what a man told me one time. WPS standards, um, a lot of this is on, available on the PERC website, PERC. Um, it's an EPA website. That website's going to look like that. If you have greenhouses, things of that nature, fruits that fruits and vegetables that require workers to go into the field, get on there. It's a plethora of information regarding WPS. Has simply stated, you know, how how to comply if I need to adhere to WPS standards. All that is on that website. Recycling. <laughs> so. Uh, this has um, been a little challenging this year as well. So in the past, we had a contractor. Um, people would rinse their jugs, bring them to us. We'd throw them in the jugs um, at the collection sites. In the fall, we would go around and throw all the jugs into a chipper and chip all of them up into seed bags, basically. You know, the same bags of, that uh, hold the seed. Um, they weren't seed bags, but same bags. <laughs> um, so uh, that's what we did in the past. Um, the contractor got changed this year. This is something that we don't control. And um, a couple things, he, we have not chipped them. Um, we haven't had anything to do with them really this year as far as collection, what they've done other than being at the sites when you guys bring them to us. But he's been going to each site and throwing them in a trash compactor truck and then hauling them to his site for chipping. That being said, his standards and baseline for the cleanliness of the jugs has has changed um, and unfortunately he's left a lot of jugs at the sites um, that we're going to have to dispose of or do something to take care of one way shape or form and um, you know how they say it rolls downhill well when you bring your jugs to us now we're going to have to be able to make sure they're clean you know he's turned some jugs that had just a little bit of rainwater basically that was you know just a little bit discolored and he turned them down so um, we're going to be real stringent. If you're bringing jugs to us this year, just keep that in mind. Make sure you get them rinsed out best you can, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to evaluate each one as we come. We did do um, 30 tons in 2021 of uh, recycling material. So that's good. It goes back to the agriculture industry and field drainage tiles, pesticide pallets, things of that nature. Spotted lanternfly has moved down here on the shore more. Um, it was in Cecil, now it's in Kent, um, the quarantine. Um, just keep that in mind. And uh, there's a, um, it's conducting business and going into those counties from uh, joining counties. Um, there is, um, a, you have to get a permit um, to do that. And you also have to keep logs of when you're going into those counties. We have to do it in our vehicles, um, just going into the counties because we're related in ag industry. Um, and business as well um, but so uh, though that's all online um, I think there's a website there you go so um, you can just if you're going into Kent County it's one of the things you have to do um, get that permit and just log when you go in there albeit if you go up in there all day write it down when you, it's you have to check the vehicle over make sure you didn't see any spotted lantern flies things of that nature and all that information is available on our website